yes. Father, we come to shout out the praise of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Father, that you actually take residence in our lives. So, Lord, we have come to gather to hear from your word. So speak to us like we've never been spoken to before, as only you can, the God of creation. There is joy in this house because of Jesus Christ. We praise you and we pray to you, and we are worshiping here and now. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Well, good morning, church. If you would, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Uh, today, again, we'll be in uh, Mark chapter 12, picking up our study there. If you're using a Bible in the seat in front of you, that's on page 848. If you do not own a Bible, that is our gift to you today. Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 18. And Sadducees came to him, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring and the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. <laughs> Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Is he not? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. Yeah. And may God bless the reading and our hearing of his word. You may be seated. Words we never want to hear from our Savior, unless they're convicting, right? Uh, good morning. My name is Dave. I'm one of the elders here at MCC. I uh, just want to welcome you. Uh, for, for those here and online, Happy New Year. Uh, just a few announcements. First of all, uh, the... Um, the worship guide has plenty of announcements in it. I'm not going to go through all of those, but if you would, um, fill out the connection card in the seat in front of you. Looks like that. Uh, it lets us know that you're here, uh, lets us know how to pray for you. It's a great place to put those. You can also click on the QPR code in the worship guide and fill that out there. Um, that way we can, we can know you're here worshiping with us. And if you have any questions, pray, prayer requests, praises, uh, let us know that. They are reviewed every Monday. So don't underestimate the power of staff here and the elder team and the prayer, uh, the prayer team reviewing those and, and praying for uh, this congregation. Uh, lastly, let me point to the new transformation verse. As Gil said, it's a new year. Uh, it's also a new month. So our ch January transformation verse is, and to love him with all the heart, all, feel free to follow me, you know, follow along with me, all the understanding, all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than burnt offerings and sacrifices. Mark 12, 33. There's a card in the seat in front of you. Uh, feel free to grab that and uh, study that this month. I've always thought if, um, if I tucked away 12 verses a year thoroughly, like really know them, it's 12 I didn't have the year before, right? Pray with me. Father, thank you for this day, this morning, this, this day that you've created for us. That's for your glory. I pray that you are glorified in this place. 
I pray that you would remind us uh, that you do love us. Uh, we are special because you are. You put the value in us. And I pray that we would take that and make much of your name and not ours. Uh, Lord, let us hear the message today. Let us hear your word. It's how you love us now. Let us hear that word. Let it transform us. Strengthen your servant Todd as he brings that to us. In your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Good morning, family. Those watching online and those that could keep be here for this uh, first Sunday of the year, just a good reminder that uh, uh, we didn't know what we'd be doing two years ago or even maybe a year ago. The fact that we could still meet and worship, it's a, it's a good day. And uh, we only get to spend this day once, so we're spending it well already by being together. Take your Bible or your phone and turn to Mark, if you would, and we're looking at heaven, sex, and marriage, which is always great themes to look at. These, these Sadducees, they come to Jesus, and they seek to trip him up. They seek to embarrass him publicly. Mark wants us to know, and that's why we titled this series, Let's Go, is that Jesus had a theology that could not be denied. Theology means experiencing God, understanding God, knowing God. He had a theology, an understanding, a knowledge of God the Father that could not be denied. No matter what question he was asked, he pointed to God and he pointed to God's ways. But he also had a power that could not be dismissed. He had a power to be compassionate to lepers or to be kind to his enemies or to heal someone or raise the dead. Mark is writing this little short gospel compared to the rest, and he's saying it's not how much we know, it's not about information, it's about transformation. And he said, let's go. Let's go to our homes, our schools, our families, wherever he calls us, and let's have a theology that can't be denied and a power that cannot be dismissed. That's the way he lived, and Mark is wanting us to live that way. This group comes to him, and they do not, they do not believe in the resurrection. Now, right now, about 80% of Americans say they believe in life after death. That may be uh, nirvana or any kind of life after death. But 80% believe in life after death. 9% say they're not sure. 11% say they do not believe. So that 11% would represent this group called the Sadducees. So just to pick up real quickly, to understand where we are and how we address people who disagree with us. That is what's happening this last week. There's a bunch of controversies, and Mark is putting these controversies in and saying, here's how Jesus treated people who disagreed with him. The Pharisees, you remember, they were the cold conservatives. They were as far right as you could get. They, they would have been moral people for the most part. They would have voted right, dressed right, spoke right. But Jesus said about them, you have no real love, kind of like the church in Ephesus. He said, you're doing so many things well, but you lost your first love a long time ago. You don't have a passion for me. This group, the Pharisees, Jesus has the harshest words for them, and he calls them hypocrites. He calls them cold. He says they're dead. They're as straight as a gun barrel, but they're just as empty. And then there's another group called the Herodians, and they were compromisers. They wanted to compromise with Rome and King Herod and put their religion and their politics of Judaism in with the Roman gods and the Roman beliefs and wanted to mix them together. And they were constantly talking about, we must be progressive, we must be relevant. To be relevant, you have to change about every six months, or right now about every six days or six hours. You have to keep changing to be relevant. Well, they kept changing. And they were called the compromisers, and Jesus said to them, you have no truth in you. You don't live in God's truth. And then there's this third group, the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection, but they believed that you could be decent, good, moral people, and you should do your best while you live here. And uh, decency was defined in the way they defined it. And now this is the last group that's going to confront him publicly to seek to trap him and embarrass him. And you just heard the story they, they come up with. And they would be called the humanist. They're secular. They don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in angels. They only believe in the first five books of the Bible. 
They pick and choose what they believe. They've come and they've confronted him publicly. They would have made up the Sanhedrin, our, uh, our Supreme Court. These are the people that are going to judge Jesus in three days, the primary group of people that will say, you are guilty. They would have made up the Supreme Court of Judaism, so they have come and publicly in front of, again, thousands of people as they're in Jerusalem, as the Passover feast is there, they've come in the middle of the street and they say, we've got some words for you, teacher, and we have a story to tell you, and they make up a story to tell him and to confront him. And how does he interact with them? Because here's the thing, what was going on 2,000 years ago is still going on today. Many voices, many views. Many voices, many viewpoints. How does he treat his enemies? How does he interact with them? How does he speak to them, those that do not agree with him? Well, on your screen, if you'll write this in, here's their problem. They're living only for this world. You'll just write that in. They're living only for this world. Everybody has core issues. One writer calls it the sacred core. Everybody has core issues of their beliefs, their convictions, what they hold to. And Jesus is going to their core values. It says there in verse 18, if you've got your Bible or the sheet in front of you, the Sadducees came to him who say, that's an important word, they say versus what God says. They say there is no resurrection. When you die, you die. The worms eat your body, you disintegrate, you go into nothingness, this is all there is. You, you die, you die. There's no resurrection. And so they asked him a question saying, and they come up with this elaborate story of a man marries a woman, he dies. The brother comes in and marries her, he dies. The third one dies. She's the original black widow. Everybody dies that marries this woman. It's an absurdity. They make it absurd for a reason. His last week, he has upped the ante. I'm going to die, and I'm going to be crucified, as Isaiah and the prophet said I would, and on the third day, I will raise from the dead because I am Lord. So this group, just like the other two groups, have their theology, their beliefs disturbed, and so they're confronting him to stop him from teaching these teachings. And so they come up with this absurd thing, all seven of the brothers marry this woman. Now, they pulled this from Deuteronomy 25. In Deuteronomy 25, it was a command of Israel that if a woman died, a man in the family would marry her and take her as his wife and protect her. Remember, they don't have social security. They're out in the desert. They're nomadic people. They don't have anywhere to go with these people, widows, orphans, the hurt, the down and out. You must take care of them, God said. And so he gave Israel a way to do that. And they take this good provision, and they make it look absurd. And they say, well, whose husband will she be in marriage? Because, Rabbi, this is quite a mess. Quite a mess, seven of them. And here's a couple of things they want to do that people want to do to you and to me. I didn't put them on the screen, but I, I thought of them this week as, one, they want to make the truth look foolish. They want the truth to look foolish. And they come up with absurd things, absurd stories, absurd, quote, logical conclusions. And all you have to do is go to college and get one professor, and you'll find out this is true. And if you're not ready in your faith, they'll twist and tease and pick and come to logical conclusions, so-called logical conclusions, that will get your head spinning. And that's what they want to do. They want the truth to look foolish. But here's the second thing. They want the future to look doubtful. They want the future to look doubtful. They're, they're the original CNN, MSNBC, FNN, off Fox, and JFK134, whatever you want to come up with. They're pushing fear and doubt. Boom. Terrible thing, isn't it? We're going to die here soon, and that's all there is. And they're pushing it hard. I'm sorry, Rabbi, that some of your teachers believe there's life after death and there's some kind of thing like judgment and heaven and hell, but we all know that's not true. We're enlightened people, by the way. Now we, we've got PhDs and we're quite smart. 
sad for these poor common people to believe that this life has meaning. And so they confront him in the street and they want the truth to look foolish, but they want the future to look doubtful and people are listening and they want the people to say, they want the people to doubt. But here's the point. It is not because they're enlightened. It is not because they have certain degrees or they have a certain intelligence. The Holy Spirit is making clear something that we need to know when we talk with every single person, no matter whether their uh, IQ is off the charts or whether they're barely making it in life, whether they're wealthy or barely making it financially, whether they're at home doing the best they can with four or five children or whether they're running a company with hundreds of billions of dollars, that everybody's the same. Everybody has eternity in their heart. Right here's the answer. They don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in God's power and truth. In other words, they're living only for this world's pleasures. They are often smarter than we are. Jesus said that. They are wise as serpents. We need to be wise as serpents, he said, and harmless as doves. We don't hurt them back. We don't seek to embarrass them, and they seek to embarrass us in front of a class of people. But they will do it. But it is not because they're smarter or more educated or they've come to an enlightened state of living. It is because they want the pleasures of this world more than God. They want this world more than God. Kurt Vonnegut, he says this, being a humanist means you're trying your best to behave decently. And they use words like decent instead of good because good is a moral word. So you'll see a lot of humanists use words like decent. We, we just need to behave decently, which is still a relative term. You heard the professor a few weeks ago at one of the major universities said, you can be a decent person and still want to have sex with a three-year-old girl. Quote, unquote. Just because you're attracted to children, he said, doesn't make you somebody that needs to be an outcast. This gets very difficult in our society when people decide what decency is and what decency is not without any moral framework. So Kurt says, we just got to try to behave decently and without expectation of rewards or punishment because then you're dead. Act like as best you can, this life has meaning. Just do the best you can that it has meaning, though it has no meaning. Be decent. Christopher Hitchens, famous atheist, dead now. Human decency, same word. He says human decency used to a lot because he wanted to contrast it to God's purity or holiness or decency, which he said are antiquated, we need to give up on. But human decency is not derived from religion. I would agree with him about religion, but he said it precedes it. In other words, you're as decent as you can be because you're human and you can grow into it maybe, but you certainly don't need an outside supernatural work to be different because you can be decent and in the end, that's all there is, is death. Jean-Paul Sartre, some people say Sartre, I looked his name up, it's pronounced several different ways. He's French, that's what the French do. Life has no meaning. If you're French, you can explain that to me later. Life has no meaning. Life has no meaning. No one, zip. But it's up to you to give it meaning. Does that make sense? Of course not. Has no meaning, no absolute, no world view that we need to concoct to make absolute meaning, but you give it meaning and value, and nothing but the meaning that you choose is what counts. So he says to seven billion people, you be your own gods and you set up meaning. You set up what's meaningful. Now, that has infected a lot of people. The prime of life is said to be 18 to 45. So how many people here are out of the prime of life? Just yeah, good, you could recognize it, so you're honest. So whatever prime of life means, I feel like I'm in the prime of life. 
18 to 45, number one killer of people in the prime of life in America is not COVID, not even close. It's not cancer, it's not suicide, not car wrecks. It's fentanyl. Fentanyl. Number one killer. To a group of people that we have told for decades, you decide what meaning is, and if you run out of meaning, you can run out of your life. Number one killer. There are consequences to ideas. There's consequences to ideas. So Jesus is confronting them in the street, Oprah Winfrey, who takes her, what she calls progressive Christianity, from some of these people. She said, it's up to each of us to get still and say, this is who I am. No one else defines your life, only you do. Now, what is hard about that is it sounds good to abused women who she has a great following. It sounds good to them. In other words, your husband who abused you shouldn't define you. You should. It sounds very good. And it is a good statement, I guess, to some degree. It's just incomplete. It's incomplete. God defines who we are. And so Jesus is in the street and he is telling them I'm the only water of life. I'm the only door. I'm the only bread of life. I'm the resurrection and the life. And the people who are coming to him, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the drunkards, the down and out, the broken, are coming to him in droves and they're saying, that's the best news we've ever heard because I'm tired of messing my life up. But these groups of people are saying, how dare you say that. How could you be so bigoted and so exclusive to say there's only one way to heaven? And he keeps saying to them two simple things. Watch my teaching and my miracles and look for my resurrection. If anybody else resurrects and can teach the way I do and do the miracles I do, then I want you to turn away. And these battles, these debates, are in the streets in front of thousands of people. So that by the time he resurrects and Paul and the others go to preach the gospel to kings and authority, which they were told they would do, they keep saying... These things were not done in a corner. They were done out in the open. Jesus did not hide who he is. And neither, neither should we. He says to them, in other words, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, the good news is this. You can be successful in me and in my kingdom if you'll give up seeking to be successful in your own life. So here's what we'll do. We'll write this down in a little different way that applies to people that you interact with all the time. So on your screen, failure is being successful in the things that what? That don't matter. He's confronting them this last week of his life, and these three groups are wealthy, educated, and have power. Wealthy, educated, and have power. This is not the groups of people that he has spent three years with. He has spent three years with the least of these, the prostitutes, the lepers, the drunkards, drug addicted, down and out, adulterous, lying, and so much so that these three groups say it to him all the time. If you were somebody special like you say you are, you certainly wouldn't let these people hug you and touch you and be around you all the time. And finally, this last week, they're confronting him so much publicly that he's getting the gospel to them too. And he says to them, your failure is that you are successful. But you're successful at the things that don't matter. When you die, all the things you have will be left to someone else. And probably somebody will fight over them and get a lawyer. But you're going to leave them. And when you stand before God, and he reveals your heart motives and your life and your words as though we had a tape recorder around us at all times. When he reveals everything that we've said and done and thought, he said, none of this stuff 
or what people said about you will matter. And in Matthew 23 and other places, he said the only thing you groups will have is this. The people applauded them when they came into the synagogue. The people applauded them when they came into the chief seats of parties. The people stood up for them. They made great pomp and circumstance. We're here. And he said, all that, ah, uh-huh, wow, that's all you'll get. It'll be gone. You can see why they wanted to get rid of him. Rich Mullins on your screen, we've shared about him several times. About it. I heard a story this week that really hit this home with me. So Rich Mullins tried to be successful, he said, in different ways. He became successful as a Christian writer, songwriter, singer. Got in trouble with alcohol, battled alcohol most all of his life. Honest about it. Had deep, deep hurts from his dad. Abusive emotionally and so forth. And one of his friends said about him that he tried to be successful and happy on his own but could never shake his wounds and disappointments. And I thought, that's, that's all of us. All of us want to be happy, joyful. All of us want to be successful, whatever that means. And all of us have been sinned against. We want, we want somehow to deal with our wounds and disappointments. And I, just, I was thinking this week, as I was praying for the, the people in the passage, which I often do, like, who do these people represent? And sometimes they quite often represent me. I can be this way. But I was thinking of people who are very different from us, in disagreement with us. They got the same problems. They want success that they've defined, and they want happiness. They're just going at it the wrong way. But they can't shake their wounds and disappointments till they come to the Creator that is the only one that can heal them. And I think that's why Jesus stops in the street and just stops and says, all right, let's deal with your story. Let's talk. We've said this many times, but if there's anybody you won't talk to, Democrat, Republican, vaccinated, not vaccinated, mass, not mass, tall, short, black, white, male, female, anything. If there's anyone you won't talk to about the gospel, then something has stunted the gospel in us. Remember, these people in three days are going to say, you're deserving of death. You need to die. Their problem was they live for this world. Second, here's his proposal to them as we get ready to take communion. He says, I'm going to propose to you a perfect God and a perfect heaven. So they're not agreeing about God. They're not agreeing about heaven. But he lovingly listens to them. He listens to their story. He talks with them. But somewhere, we got to tell people the truth, right? So he says, well, let me tell you my side of the story. And he says, I believe there's a perfect God who's holy and loving. And he has a perfect heaven. And here's what is so mind-blowing to the legalist, is God is more holy than a legalist can ever come up with. Don't drink, don't go there, don't wear this, wear clothes down to your shoes, don't show an ankle, anything they come up with, cut your hair above your ears, anything. He's more holy than any rule they can come up with, but he's more loving than any liberal compromising person can think that they're more fair or loving than God. He is more loving than they ever could be. And so he blows their circuits. He hears them, they attack him, he talks to them. In verse 24, Jesus said, is this not the reason you're wrong? Isn't that radical that somebody would say to somebody they're wrong? The most loving person on earth looks at these people and says, you're wrong. I'm not saying that we go out and find somebody today and say, you're wrong, and don't do that. We're not going to turn to each other and say that. But I'm, I'm just amazed that somebody would put this picture of Jesus that he's always Almost like a great granddaddy that's senile and just pats you on the head and says, yeah, you can have $5. I don't care what you do. He looks at them and he says, you are, he's going to finish the sentence or the story by saying, you're quite wrong. I mean, you're really off base. However we say that to people, however we come across, that's one of the hardest things you're ever going to do that I'm ever going to do is even if you're kind about it, say, you know, I I believe you're wrong about heaven. 
I believe he might be wrong about life after death. I think there could be another story to that I'd like to tell you. That's what he does. He says, you're quite wrong. And you don't know the scriptures. Everybody say truth. Every Jew that heard that understood truth. Americans don't see the Bible as truth. They understood it as truth. You don't know truth, nor do you know the power of God, my spirit. So we're meant to be a truth and spirit church. We got a lot of people that are over here with the truth, 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 information, 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 and they can be cold as crazy as this could be. And got people over here, spirit, 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 rolling around doing things, and they're just kind of hard to hang around with sometimes. And Jesus was both spirit and truth. You don't know the truth. You don't know the power of God. John 5, 39, he told them, you search the scriptures to find eternal life. It's the scriptures that speak about me. In John chapter 8, he said, if you knew the truth, and abided in it, you would be set free. In John 15, he said, if you walk in the truth, you'd have a powerful prayer life and you'd bear much fruit and you would be able to live in a way that you show that you're, you belong to me. He's told them all this week, they don't know the truth. In John 14, 17, he said, the spirit is the spirit of truth. If the spirit comes into you, you would know the truth. John 15, 26, he said, the spirit is the spirit of witnesses about me, gives glory to me. You need my spirit. In John 16, 13, he said, the spirit will guide you, empower you, and lead you. He has made it clear that they have counted on their own strength, and that's their problem. They don't know the truth. They've counted on their own strength. They're not living in the truth. They counted on their own strength. Interesting, somebody sent me a, an article from Wall Street Journal and it's a study of people who are incredibly powerful, get a lot of power. This group of people, none of them Christians, scientists, different people. Here's their summary. We saw that when people get a lot of power, they tend to act like beasts. When you give people power, in summary, they start acting like foolish people. They flirt inappropriately, though they know they'll get caught. Somebody will tell them. They talked about how this phenomenon of doing something in public with everybody having phones and stuff, and they'll take pictures and send it to the wife or the husband. They said they act and flirt inappropriately. They tease and hurt people in hostile fashion. They begin to think they're better than others. They become totally impulsive and make decisions that people wonder about them. And then they said this, what we noticed is that it is quite equal to people who have brain damage. People who have brain damage in the frontal lobe lack empathy and lack good decision making. It's as if their frontal lobe has been taken away from them. That's all of us, by the way. It describes all of us at times. Like I look back and I say, how in the world did I think that was good? And that was just when I got up this morning. So I, I, everybody, everybody has that. But some people, they live that way. That's their life. And he confronts them and he says, I, I've got something to tell you. You got a lot of lies bouncing around in your head, and you live too much in your own strength. So verse 29, now he tells them the good news. 29, when, they, when these people that you're talking about, he said, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are they give it in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven. So three truths he gives them. Number one, if you write it in, there is a bodily resurrection. He said, I want you to know that there is life after death, and not only your spirit's going to rise, but I'm going to put your body back with it. Why is that important? Because he says that's what it means to be fully human, that where you go, you're going to be able to see and feel and hear. And if you're in heaven, you're going to be able to eat and drink and dance and work and touch and hug, because that's the kind of God I am. You're, gonna, you're not just going to, your spirit's not going to go in nirvana and be with the cockroaches and the leaves and the trees and go all into nothingness. No, you're going to be with God and you're going to be with people of God and you're going to be able to have joy in that. Second, there's no marriage or sex in heaven. Why? One of the best gifts that God gave us, or can be a disaster, we all know that. 
Why? Well, you will complete your purpose when the bride meets the son and the father hands us all over to the bride and we're called the bride of Christ and it will be consummated that we are now his people forever. So everything that was a picture of that will be wiped away because the real is here and it'd be like carrying a picture of a loved one and you have the picture and then you've seen these things where people come home from the war or whatever and they, they've got something on their phone or a picture and the guy sneaks in and he looks like a mailman but he's dad from Iraq and you're looking at the picture and they look and they say, I'll just leave it over there and whoa, that's my dad. And you drop the picture and you run and you jump and you hug and you kiss. He said, it's going to be beyond what you think or imagine and there's going to be a completeness that some things are going to be gone, they're going to be wiped away because they're better, satisfying. Now that is quite amazing because there's some things in this world, marriage, sex, walking with grandchildren, whatever it might be, you could pick a thousand things. Sunshine in the morning. Remember that day last week when it, the sun was out, that sunshine in the morning. There's a thousand things you could say. And he says, it's going to be beyond what you can think or imagine. By the way, that starts here. Ephesians 3.20 starts here. Beyond what you could think or imagine, starts here. It just gets blown up in heaven. Also, there's no procreation. If you want to write that down, there's no procreation in heaven. There, there'll be no more people being procreated. All of God's children will be in heaven and nobody will be missing. Nobody will be left out. Third, will fully enjoy and follow the Lord. So it ties into number two. We're going to fully enjoy and follow the Lord. He said, you'll be like the angels. Well, what are the angels doing? They're fully enjoying and fully obeying the Lord. So we're going to be like them. Only the Bible says we'll be above them and they'll be underneath us. And in the end, we'll judge even the angels. So the sons and daughters of God will rise above the angels. Somebody better say something or I'm going to just keep going. We're going to rise above the angels and yes thank you and and they will serve us because we are the king's children just like they serve us now except we'll get to see them face to face so when he looks at them and says, you're quite wrong, he is not being dogmatic or bigoted or close-minded or anything else. He is saying to them, I wish, I wish you had a theology that could not be denied and a power that could not be dismissed. I would hate to live as though this life is all there is. That's what he's saying to them. I hope you rethink it. There's much more, much more. I read this week where they ask a lady, uh, in a, a museum curator, what would you tell people? What's the number one thing you tell people about a museum? She said, don't treat it like a theme park. You're like me. I thought, what does, what does that mean? She says, you go to a theme park, you pay a certain amount of money, you think you got to get them all, you got to get all the rides in on a day. And so you go to this ride and you run to this ride and you run this ride and you drag your kids. We got to get our money's worth and you drag them up here and you stay out in the hot sun for an hour and you ride it and you look at somebody and say, wasn't that fun? And then somebody's crying and you look at them and say, we're going to have fun. We paid $79.99 for this. And you're dragging it around and you say, we got to get our money's worth. She said, you come to a museum. She said, you should walk casually and look and enjoy and savor and then walk casually and look and enjoy and savor. She said, it's not how many rides you get on. It's how many wonderful pictures you get to see before it's done. And she said, if you do that, at the end you'll say, I'd like to come back. I'd like to have some more of this. He lovingly says to the Sadducees, if you only knew you'd say, I'd like to have some more of what you got. Third, 
God's promise before we take communion. He is the God of life. He's the God of life. As for the dead, verse 26, being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. You are quite wrong. Now, I don't know that we can do that with people in our culture because we don't believe the Bible's true, but I do believe what he did is what we want to do is he found common ground with them and they believed in the book of Moses. So he said, all right, just skip the rest of the Bible. Let's talk about what you believe. What about, what about Moses, who they honored? Do you remember when he came to the bush and God said to him, I'm here, I am. He's the God of the living. We need to find common ground with people. They have the same desires as us down deep. They just go about fulfilling them in different ways. Jesus says to these people, you'd never be robbed of life if you really knew me. You wouldn't have to chase or force or push. You'd never be robbed of life. So before we take communion, I thought we'd pray and we'd Prepare our hearts with two prayers. One of them's on your screen for 2022. I thought we'd just say, Lord, cause me and others to really live today. I mean, really live. You may have something very specific about that. Lord, restore my joy to me. Lord, deal with my anxiety. Uh, Lord, let me see you again. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little dull here. I'm, I'm dragging my feet. I'm getting a little tired spiritually. You, you know, but somebody's in your mind or heart. Maybe they're sitting beside you. They need to really live today in Christ. Let's pray for each other and ourselves, and we'll just take a moment and pray. And then we're going to pray one more prayer that's outward-centered, and then we'll take communion together. So let's pray together. So we're going to pray, Lord, that you cause us and others to really live today. You'll look up. Here's our second prayer. I'm going to pray that God would cause us and others to live for the good news. Uh, this is going to, Jesus has been foreordained to die, but humanly speaking, this is the turning point. This is going to cause him to go to his death, humanly speaking. He's willing to put his life on the line for the gospel to people who do not love him, who have different voices and different views than him. So that's what we'll pray right now. Lord, cause me and others to live for the good news. So would you pray that right now in 2022? That we'll really live and we'll live for the good news. Father, as we sing this one song to prepare our hearts to take communion, that we would announce that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord, and pray that you'll move in us to joyfully thank you again for who you are and for what you've done. We pray for someone in this room or watching that they will come to a place of repentance. They will turn around from living for themselves and living in their sin. And they will believe in you, not try for you, not work hard for you, but they will believe in you, the Son of God, who lived a righteous life, who died for our punishment on the cross, and who rose again from the grave, 
and who sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for all of his people. Holy Spirit, make this happen. No matter who you are here today, if you love God through Christ Jesus, take communion with us. This first Sunday, announce again that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. And God's people said, Amen. With your blood, you, you bought my freedom, oh hallelujah. Please stand with us as we sing this. Oh hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not. Cause with your blood, cause with your blood, you. You buy my freedom, oh hallelujah, oh the cross, oh hallelujah, oh the cross, oh hallelujah, oh the cross. 
As we come to the Lord's table, the communion is underneath your chair right there in front of you. You'll tear off that little thin sheet above on the top. There's a piece of bread there. The night that Jesus first served this, he sent Judas out of the room because it was not for those who do not love him. It is for his people who have come to trust him as Savior and Lord. And he said to those he loved and those who loved him, as he broke the bread in front of them, this is my body broken for you, take and eat. So take and eat in remembrance of Christ. Tear the top off again and the juice is underneath. He took the cup. They had celebrated for generations the removal of Israel from Egypt. Now, he said, it'll be celebrated as the removal of us from sin and death into life in him, in Christ Jesus. Take and drink in remembrance of him. God's people said, amen. Would you turn and greet someone as you leave? The team's going to keep playing. Say hello to a few people. God bless. And Happy New Year. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.